that hymn you played is a perfect introduction to my message today, so thank you for selecting that. Uh, I'm Drew Ramsey, and uh, I told the men earlier that I've observed Oak Grove Baptist Church from Highway 119 for many years, uh, but my first occasion to be here, and I'm sorry it took Dr. Peters being sick <laughs> uh, to get us here today, but that's what happened. He, uh, I lead a men's group on every Tuesday morning, and yesterday, and Dr. Peters is a part of the group that I lead, and we took a little outing yesterday to a friend's place with around the lake down in Coosa County. Well, I took barbecue and the sauce and all of that. And some of us got sick and some didn't. I don't know how to explain that, but that's what happened. And unfortunately, Dr. Peters was one of those that got sick. So I think it's very temporary. Some others who were sick have already communicated this morning that uh, they are much better today. So we're grateful for that, and I hope Dr. Peters is as well. I joined the staff of Shades Mountain Independent Church in November of 1976. That's many years ago. <laughs> My primary ministry at that time was leading evangelism and discipleship training under the pastoral uh, leadership of Dr. Uh, Dick Vignell. Some of you know that name. But as time went along, my ministry evolved to pastoral care. And I think Dick Vignell, in his sensitivity to people and spiritual gifts, recognized that my spiritual gift was more in the area of pastoral care than in evangelism and discipleship, even though I had, Barbara and I were nine years with Campus Crusade where evangelism and discipleship was our primary focus, our training in ministry. I retired uh, from, well, I've retired twice from Shades Mountain Independent. It's now Shades Mountain Community Church, as you may know. I retired twice, the first time in 1999, after uh, 23 years, and then I came back later for another three years. After a short retirement in 1999, I joined the staff of World Reach, which is a local mission agency. And my first, one of my f early missions was to Russia with Jim Scott, another missionary. And we were in uh, Kropotka. These Russian names throw me off a little bit. <laughs> Most of them start with a K, Kropotka. And we were in the Krasnodar region of Russia. And it was on a Sunday. And Jim was assigned to preach at one church, and I was assigned to preach at a different church that night. Well, <clears throat> mine was located in the village of Kavkaskaya. And the place of worship for the church where I was preaching was in the backyard of one of the members. They had chairs set up in a a lectern, and that was, that was my preaching assignment. But while I was there, a couple of the men took me on a short walk to a building that was under construction, and they explained to me that this was their uh, f a future place of worship. And as we stood there in, front of, in, the, in the front of the building, there was a sign over the door of the church. And of course, it was in Russian, and I couldn't read it, and so I asked, what does the sign say? And they said, the sign says, prayer house, prayer house. I was reminded of Jesus' words. You remember them well. And when he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And the thought came to me, I was impressed that that statement, how prayer house, that statement ought not only to describe every place of worship, every church building as a prayer house, but also every home, every Christian's heart and mind should be a place of prayer. 
So today I want to speak on that subject. Prayer. Do you know who you're talking to? Now, if I said that to my English teacher in high school, Miss Haney, she would say, Drew, you never end a statement with a preposition. <laughs> so may I change the title of that? Do you know to whom you are talking when you pray? Do you know to whom you're talking when you pray? Now, that's not an evangelistic question. You might say to somebody, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Now, this is not an evangelistic question when I say, do you know to whom you're talking? You see, there's a difference, isn't there, in just knowing someone and really, really knowing that person. Um, Barbara and I met on a blind date in 1960. Blind date. And we married 364 days later. We said it didn't take us a year. <laughs> so, well, um, that was 59 years ago. In November, we'll be celebrating 60 years as husband and wife. Now, if the day after I met Barbara, her maiden name was Knowles, if you had asked me the next day, do you know Barbara Knowles? I would very casually say, yeah, I met her last night. I know her. I know her. Now, there's a, I did know her. I knew her name, and I knew she was a student nurse, and I knew she was from Gadsden, and, you know, just a few general things I knew about her at that time, the day after I met her. Fifty-nine years later, now, if you ask me, do you know Barbara Ramsey? Don't you know my answer would be quite different, wouldn't you? Now, uh, after 59 years, if you ask me that, I would say absolutely I know Barbara Ramsey. I really, really know her. And in knowing her, I love her deeply more all the time as the days go by I know her more I love her I trust her I enjoy being with her more than anyone else in the world there's a difference you see in just knowing I met her yesterday and now knowing her after 59 <clears throat> years of marriage I really know her so there's a difference and knowing and really knowing after a long relationship. So the same is in our relationship with God. The day after you became a Christian, uh, if someone had asked you, do you know Jesus Christ? You would say, yeah, yeah, I, I put my faith in him. Yeah, I received him yesterday. I accepted him yesterday. And you knew, you knew him the day after. Now, after being a Christian for, I don't know, five years, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, you, you really, really know Jesus Christ. And you might even quote a scripture. He does, he's delivered me from the darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom and brought me into the kingdom of his dear son who bought my freedom with his blood and has forgiven all of my sins. Now you really know him. So when I ask that question, there's a difference in a casual knowing, a first day after knowing, or knowing God after, after many years. Now let me ask you this question, <clears throat> and I know the obvious answer, but just to make my point as we talk about prayer. When you are in in talking to someone, in communication, conversation with someone, would you rather have conversation with a total stranger, someone that you don't know very well at all, maybe somebody you just met who's still a stranger, or would you ra rather have conversation with someone that you have known a long time and someone with whom you have a close, friendly good relationship? Well, I think the answer for most of us would be 
I would rather have conversation with somebody that I know re really well and enjoy being with. And rather than a, if it's a stranger, your conversation is often strained, it's guarded, um, it's surfaced just, and it's probably very brief, uncomfortable, or maybe not even at all. But if you have <coughs> a conversation with someone that you know well, that you trust, that's a friend, that you have a good relationship, perhaps for years, then your conversation with them, your talking with them, is going to be relaxed. Um, it's going to be friendly, enjoyable. It's going to be trusting, comfortable, and probably last a long time. Barbara told me when I came home from this outing yesterday, she said I was on the phone with a friend for an hour. Now, that's a friend. That's a long-term friend for an hour. If it had been a stranger, it would probably been over in 30 seconds. So there's a difference when you're in conversation with a strange, someone that you don't know very well or a long-term, long-time friend. Now, when I became a Christian <coughs> at the age of about 31, one of the things that impressed me about Christianity is that it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. A personal, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, a lot of people become Christians in church or maybe in their home. I was at the dentist in the chair with him grinding away, and that's where I became a Christian. Because as he did his work, he talked about a personal relationship with Jesus. And I, even though I was a longtime church member, I didn't understand what he was talking about, a personal relationship. But I'm, I know that's, <clears throat> that's a fact that's so basic to our Christianity, a personal relationship. But I think sometimes we don't appreciate that. We don't understand that. We, don't, we take it too casual. We lose the meaning in its familiarity with us. But don't ever, don't ever, ever lose the amazement, the awe, the incredible truth that if you're a Christian, you have a personal relationship with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, your Savior. It's you and God, a personal relationship. And of course, by faith, we are bound together in the body of Christ. Now there's, I don't think, any discipline of the Christian life the Christian faith where this personal relationship is more evident or more important and more necessary to understand than in the discipline of prayer. Prayer. Simply put, prayer is having a conversation with Almighty God. Now think about that, folks. When you bow your head in your place of prayer, you're having conversation with Almighty God. What an amazing truth. When we pray, we need, and I'm going to amplify this as we go along, we need to be consciously aware of the personal relationship that we have with the Lord. That you and I are literally talking with God, our Heavenly Father, who is King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Um, I love the verse of Scripture in Psalm 34, verse 15 says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. Now, think about that. God is watching over you. 
He sees you. He's aware. He sees us here as we gather this morning at Oak Grove Baptist Church. He sees us. We're never out of his sight. I don't know how it makes you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, you're in the sight of God. And the other part of that verse, his ears are open to our cry. I, you know, to me, I don't, I know there's a lot of verses of scripture that emphasize this personal relationship, but to me, that verse really does say to Drew, you're in a personal relationship with God. He sees you and he listens to you. Now, I grew up on a farm <clears throat> down in West Alabama, Sumter County. Um, our house was on a hill. We had about five acre front yard and about that much in the back between our house and the barn. And as a little guy, I would say, Mama, can I go outside and play? And most of the time she would say, yes, you can. And then she would add this statement, but stay where I can see you. <laughs> that took the fun out of it. <laughs> Say what I can see. I didn't appreciate it th at the time. But later I realized she's watching over me. If I fell out of the tree I was climbing, or if I stepped on a nail, or if a stray dog came through, she's watching. She's watching. God watches over us, and he listens to us. His ears. How many times, Barbara, do you hear me as we pray together? Lord, thank you that your ears are open to my cry. God listens. He hears us. He sees us. Personal, personal relationship. We think God so loved the world, and he does. But we're one of his people in the world in which we live. God loves us. He sees us. He watches over us. So, as we talk about prayer and a personal relationship. Prayer confirms that. True prayer is really reserved for the child of God as he worships or as she worships and confesses sin or expresses thanksgiving and makes request of his heavenly Father. So the question is, how is this possible? A mere person, mere human being in communication with God. How in the world? I don't understand it all. How my words spoken here on earth can be heard in heaven in the ears of Almighty God. I don't know. But the scripture declares that's, that's exactly what happens. I want you to turn in your Bibles I know you were beginning to wonder if I was ever going to get to the book. <laughs> Go to Hebrews. We're going to look at, <clears throat> and you probably know the answer. I've been hearing about what an incredible Bible teacher uh, Jim is, and you know the answer to this, but how is it possible But you and I as mere human beings but children of God can approach a holy and righteous God and make our request known. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Um, I'm going to just hit some highlights in this passage to answer the question. How can you and I approach a, have a holy, righteous, eternal, faithful, heavenly Father? You look at verse uh, in Hebrews 1 to 6. I'm just going to hit some highlights. Go to verse 3. And we learn that the sacrifices that were offered in the Old Testament simply reminded people of their sin. Verse 3, they had to be repeated year after year after year. I read through the Bible. <laughs> And I really don't like to get to the book of Leviticus. <laughs> I don't know about y'all. I know that's a part of the text. It's the inspired scripture. But I, 
it, it's tiring to read how often they had to bring the sacrifices of bulls and goats and sheep and doves over and over and over again. They must have had a big corral or something, I don't know. But thousands upon thousands. Dick Vignell used to say, don't you know that altar was a stinking, bloody mess? You think about it. And the priest, I'm glad I'm a pastor on this side and not a priest there <laughs> for all of the handling of and the performing of all of the sacrifices they had to make repeatedly, year after year after year. Verse 4 tells us it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Go to verse 10. We learn that we are sanctified through the body of Jesus Christ for all time, once and for all, for all time. Verse 12. Look at verse 12. But he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down. What does that tell us? His work was finished. Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. Sin left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all. He, all his work was done. He sacrificed. Was, work was finished. Go down to verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And there, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Now, what a difference. In the Old Testament, the mountain, they were told to don't come near. Stay away. If you come, you touch the mountain, you'll die. But here we're called, draw near, draw near. Let us draw near with a sincere heart. New King, New King James says, let us draw near with a true heart. New American Standard that I just read says, with a sincere heart. The uh, New Living Translation Ephesians 3, you don't need to turn there. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come fearlessly into God's presence, assured of a glad welcome by the blood of Christ. He opens the way. Our, the word boldness, we can come boldly. That's, I believe, in the next verse. Let us hold, um, let's see. Having our hearts, verse 22, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean with, from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith, our hope, without wavering, for he that wavereth, for, for the he, he promised is faithful. And we go on, and I believe past, uh, it, the, that last verse was mentioned earlier. So men, men and women, brothers and sisters, this fact that we can draw near to Jesus Christ should constantly amaze us. humble us and leave us breathless in absolute awe full of thanksgiving and praise and worship to almighty God that you and I can draw near what an amazing amazing truth now what do you know about the one to whom you're drawing near. What do you know about the one in whom 
you're entering into his presence by the blood of Christ. Do you know him? Do you really, really know him? I'm not I'm telling you again, this is not a, an evangelistic question. I'm speaking, I trust, to brothers and sisters in Christ. How well do you know the one that, that, that you're drawing near to, the one in whose presence you're coming, the one that you're going to be conversing with in what we call prayer? How well do you know him? I, uh, is he a stranger to you? Or do you know him? I used the illustration of my relationship with Barbara. The day after I met her, if you would ask me, do you know Barbara? No, yeah, I met her last night. But now after 59 years of marriage, do you really, really, do you know her? And yes, really, I love her, I trust her. I'd rather be with her than anyone else in the world. Where are you in that equation? Let's talk about that for a few minutes. <clears throat> with a question. When you pray, I hope you do. I hope you have a daily, regular time of prayer. How many of you would like to pray with greater faith faith that God hears and that he's able to accomplish the things that you're asking. So as you enter the presence of the Lord in prayer, it's important that you're consciously aware of the one to whom you're speaking that you're consciously aware of his attributes. That's theology, the knowledge of God. How well? That theology is not something just reserved for the Bible school and seminary. But theology, the knowledge of God, is for all of us as believers in Jesus Christ. To be aware of his attributes that you have your mind, listen, when you pray, what's your mind on? And I believe in prayer, our mind needs to be set on the one to whom you're talking. Our mind set on God himself. Now I want to share with you something that's been helpful to me. This is my prayer diary. It's simply a little notepad that I bought. I don't know where I got it. Dollar General or somewhere like that. They're not expensive. But I write down for years. Well, I shouldn't say for years. For a long time, people at the church would come to me and say, Brother Drew, would you pray for me? And they would give me a request. i said, say, yeah, I'll pray. And I'd forget it. Yeah, have you ever done that? Be honest. You probably have. Get a notebook to write down the things that people ask you to pray for. Write them down. This one goes back to 2015. But I've got several others <laughs> that I've filled up that go beyond that. I write down the prayer request. Just enough for me to remind me what they're asking me to pray. But in this, I have a sheet of paper. On the one side, it says, God, discover his character. And the on the other side, the names of God. And so often, before I pray, I, I read this. I just read it to myself, review it. This is from a book written by Dr. Bill Bright. I'll tell you about later. It says, because God is a personal spirit, I will seek intimate fellowship with him. Because God is all-powerful, he can help me with anything. Because he's ever-present, 
He's always with me. Because God knows everything, I will go to him with all my questions and my concerns. Because God is sovereign, I will joyfully submit to his will. Because God is holy, I will devote myself to him in purity, worship, and service. Because God is righteous, I will live by his standards. Because God is just, he will always treat me fairly. Because God is love, he is unconditionally committed to my well-being. Because God is merciful, he forgives me of my sins when I sincerely confess them. Because God is faithful, I will trust him to always keep his promises. And because God never changes, my future is secure and eternal. When I re review that, God's attributes, it helps, it reminds me of the one to whom I'm speaking when I pray. We all, you need that. You need something like that, brothers and sisters, so that when you pray, your mind focuses on the attributes of God. So often, um, so I've, I've, well let me mention this before I make my next statement the verse of scripture Psalm chapter 9 verse 10 those who know thy name David's wrote those who know thy name put their trust in you those when you know the name of God or the attributes of God then you will Put, his, put your trust in him. Go to Psalm chapter 36. The book of Psalm chapter... This is a Psalm of David. And I want you to notice as David writes, let's begin at verse 5. Notice as this is a A psalm of David, the servant of the Lord. Verse 5. Notice as David writes and prays. I just, you read this, you are aware of the fact that this is a prayer. Verse 5. Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. So right off the bat, one verse, we've got two of God's attributes. His loving kindness, some translation says mercy, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Verse 6, your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments, God's word, are like a great deep. O oh Lord, you preserve man and beast. He's the protector. How precious is your loving kindness. Again, loving kindness is repeated. And the children of men take refuge. He's the protector in the shadow of your wings. They drink their fill of the abundance of your house, satisfied. You give them to drink from the river of your delight. God is a God who delights. He delights in blessing us. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. So David, as he prays, he reviews in his words, in his mind, his words, these attributes of God. Brothers and sisters, when you pray, that's an excellent practice. David's mind is filled with the thoughts of God. Uh, no mention of a problem here. He just focused on worship and the attributes of God. David is confident of God's attributes and God's ability to do whatever he requests of God that is according to his will. So whatever David's problem or his needs, whatever his concerns, pales in comparison with the greatness of God. Ephesians 3.20, how many of you know that verse by heart? 
Ephesians 3.20. For my God is able to do what? Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I ask or even imagine according to the power that worketh in us. God is able. So it's too often, I've been guilty of this, too often we come to our time of prayer with a greater knowledge of our problem or our concerns than we do of the attributes of God. And the more we emphasize the problem that we're dealing with, the bigger that problem gets and the smaller our view of God becomes. I'll give you an illustration. Our oldest son, his name is Stuart. Uh, he, was, he was living in Pensacola, planning to move to Birmingham. So he knew he needed to move his furniture and, you know, all of that. The week before he was to move, I think he called us two or three times. He said, Daddy, I, I've got a piece of furniture at, in Pensacola that I need to move to Birmingham, but it's just too big for me to handle, too big for me to move. I've forgotten what the piece of furniture was, but he said, it's too big. I can't manage it. I'm not going to be able to move it. He worried, and he worried about it. And the more he thought about it, the bigger that piece of furniture became. And the more he worried about it. Well, the day came for him to move. He drives from Birmingham to Pensacola. He walks into his residence there. He looks at this piece of furniture and he said, it wasn't nearly as big as I thought it was. <laughs> and he moved it with ease. The more he worried and thought about that piece of furniture, the bigger it got. And brothers and sisters, that's the way it is often in our relationship with God as we pray. The more we focus on the problem and the concerns that we have, the bigger they get. And it diminishes our view of God. We need to reverse that formula. We need to reverse that equation. We need to focus on God. We need to get our view of God that he's holy, he's righteous, he's sovereign. He's all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present. He's the God of love and mercy and grace. He's faithful and true and just. We need to get that view of God, not our view of the problem. Our country is facing monumental issues. And sometimes we watch the news and we listen to it and we read the paper and we, other sources, the internet and the problems of our nation get bigger and bigger and bigger and finally we decide even God can't handle this. That's wrong, that's wrong. We need to focus on, on the Lord. We need to get to know Him more completely because the better you know the Lord, the more you're going to trust Him. Just like in personal human relationship, you don't trust a stranger. You trust the person that you know. The person who has proven to be trustworthy, you trust them. You can trust God. I hope you know that. I hope you believe that. You can trust God. All things work together for good to those who trust Him. So, too often we concentrate more on the problem. The problem gets too big even for God to handle. Reverse that equation. Focus on the Lord. And I'm, as, so as we conclude today, when you come to your time of prayer, husbands, um, you need to call it husbands, fathers, take the lead in calling your wife, your children, if there are grandchildren, if you live with them, call them together to pray. And as you begin to pray, remind yourself and those with whom you're praying of the attributes of God. Focus on Him. The trials of life 
I wish I had time to talk to you about Psalm 63. Amazing. That David was going through such tremendous challenges. His son Absalom was trying to kill him. And he had to get out of town. But you read that in this psalm almost of worship and praise rather than, Lord, would you do something to Absalom? <laughs> so as you come to your time of prayer, use a prayer diary, something you've got written down. You know, I can go through my prayer diary for years. When, I, when God answers a prayer, I put a T-Y by that request which says, thank you, God. When I go back, and look at how many TYs, how many thank yous I've got where God has heard and answered prayer. Guess what that does to my faith? It builds it. It strengthens it. Know that God is faithful. He hears. He is active. He is, does pay attention. He is listening. And he is able. So I'd encourage you to do that. Get your prayer diary. And when God answers, don't forget to thank him for his answers. Mark it in your prayer diary, and that will grow your faith. Okay, as I close, I'm going to recommend two books to you. If you need another book besides the Bible, there's a lot of them available. I love the, bo the books by A.W. Tozer, The Attributes of God. It's a two-volume, great, great books. And the other one is by Bill Bright, called God, Discover His Character. Now, the best source is right here, God's Word. So I want to I suggest a, a little exercise for you. Go to the last six chapters of the book of Psalms with a notepad in, by your side. And as you read those chapters, make a list of every attribute of God that David the psalmist, not, not always David, the psalmist mentions in those six chapters. Write them down. And then keep that list close to your, your Bible and your prayer time so that as you come to pray, you've got that list to encourage you in your faith. Amen? Amen? Amen.